What is up, everybody? My name is Jeremy, and welcome to the channel. Season 1 of House of the Dragon introduced us to a ton of new dragons, each with their own color, size, shape, and personality. But what about the rest of the fire-breathing beasts that we're set to meet during the rest of this series? Well, that's exactly what we'll be talking about on this episode when we dive into the 17 dragons that we will be meeting during the House of the Dragon TV series. Starting with number one, Cyrax. Cyrax was a she-dragon and was the mount of Princess Rhaenyra Targaryen. Cyrax had yellow scales and was a huge formidable beast. But by the time that the Dance of the Dragons came around, Cyrax had spent many years chained up in the dragon pit and was extremely well fed and didn't have to hunt much, which made it much more domesticated than some of the other dragons. Rhaenyra first claimed Cyrax in 104 AC, when the princess was just seven years old. Cyrax was described as a young dragon at the time, and given the fact that Rhaenyra named Cyrax herself after an ancient god of old Valyria, it's pretty safe to assume that Rhaenyra was the first rider that Cyrax had. Cyrax would go on to lay several different clutches of eggs during her lifetime, including one given to Rhaena, Rhaenyra's stepdaughter, and it's also implied that all three of Rhaenyra's son's dragons hatched from eggs laid by Cyrax, but there's no confirmation of that. One thing we do know as fact, though, is that Rhaena's dragon Mourning did in fact hatch from a clutch laid by Cyrax. Overall, Cyrax was a very royal and regal type of dragon, and wasn't exactly bred for war like some of the other Targaryen dragons, which made it perfect for a queen or princess to mount, but was still very fearsome nonetheless when it had to be. Up next, we have my personal favorite, Caraxes, the Blood Worm. Caraxes was a huge, formidable dragon and was no stranger to war, having seen combat with both of its riders, Aemon Targaryen and years later with Daemon Targaryen. Caraxes was described as huge, red, lean, and very experienced in battle, and would go on to take part in many key moments during the Dance of the Dragons. Caraxes was first claimed by Prince Aemon Targaryen in 72 AC. The Dragon Keepers considered him to be the fiercest of all of the young dragons in the Dragon Pit at the time where he earned his nickname, the Bloodworm. Aemon used Caraxes in battle for the first time in 83 AC against the Dornish fleet in the fourth of the Dornish Wars. Then again in 92 AC, Aemon flew Caraxes to Tarth, where a group of Meermen invaded the island. Aemon, along with lords Cameron Tarth and Bormund Baratheon, managed to fight off the invading party. Then, Aemon unfortunately took a crossbow bolt to the neck, while Caraxes was reportedly eating a herd of goats. Then, fast forward to 105 AC, where a young Daemon Targaryen claims Caraxes, and the two would go on to be one of the most formidable duos of dragon and dragon rider to ever live. Daemon first used Caraxes in the War for the Stepstones from 106 AC to 115 AC. Then, later on during the Dance of the Dragons, Daemon and Caraxes would fight for Rhaenyra and the Blacks, and would be involved in many key battles during the war including probably the single greatest feat ever achieved by any dragon rider to ever live. But I won't spoil exactly what that is, as I'm sure it's going to make for an epic scene on House of the Dragon. But rest assured, we have a ton of incredibly cool moments to look forward to with Daemon and Caraxes during the Dance of the Dragons. Up next, we have Vagar, the She-Dragon. Vagar was born in 52 AC on Dragonstone and was the mount of Queen Visenya Targaryen, the wife and sister of Aegon the Conqueror. Vagar and Visenya played a big role in the conquest of Westeros. Together with their other sister Rhaenys, Aegon and his sisters managed to capture six of the Seven Kingdoms, with the exception of Dorne who managed to resist being conquered after learning from the mistakes of Aegon's previous enemies. While we never got an official description in the books, an artist that George R. R. Martin commissioned for the 2021 A Song of Ice and Fire calendar asked for clarification as to Vagar's look, to which George replied that Vagar was bronze with greenish-blue highlights and bright green eyes. Originally the smallest of Aegon's three dragons, Vagar would eventually grow to become almost as large as Beleriand the Black Dread. 
After Queen Visenya passed away, Vagar would go on to have two new riders in her lifetime, in Balon Targaryen and Lena Velaryon, before being claimed by a young Aemon Targaryen in 120 AC. Aemon and Vagar became one of the most fiercest duos of dragon and dragon riders to take place in the Dance of the Dragons. The two would go on to fight in many different key battles, including the initial battle that kicks off the entire Dance of the Dragons, when Vagar and Aemon kill Lucerys and his young dragon Arax above Shipbreaker Bay. And with that, the War of Ravens came to an end, and the War of Fire and Blood officially began. Up next, we have Sunfire the Golden. Sunfire was hatched on Dragonstone, and while we don't know the exact date of its birth, he's described as being a young dragon in 120 AC. Sunfire had gleaming gold scales and pink wing membranes. His flames were even said to be golden, and he's widely considered as the most beautiful of all of the Targaryen dragons. Sunfire was the mount of King Aegon II Targaryen, and was often referred to as King Aegon's glory. Aegon even went so far as to officially change the color on the banner of House Targaryen, going from a red three-headed dragon to a gold three-headed dragon to honor Sunfire. Despite his youth, Sunfire was described as huge, heavy, and very formidable in battle. After being crowned in the Dragon Pit, Aegon II and Sunfire would go on to fight in a few key battles during the Dance of the Dragons, the first of which being the Battle of Rook's Rest in 129 AC, one of the bloodiest battles to go down during the war. In fact, some of the biggest moments of the Dance of the Dragons involve Sunfire in one way or another, and Fire and Blood readers know exactly what I'm talking about. But rest assured, we have many jaw-dropping moments to look forward to with Sunfire on House of the Dragon. Up next, we have Maelys, the Red Queen. Maelys was the mount of Princess Rhaenys Targaryen and was claimed in 87 AC. She had scarlet scales and pink membranes on her wings, with horns and claws said to be as bright as copper. In 75 AC, Maelys was considered one of the swiftest dragons in Westeros, easily outpacing other dragons like Caraxes and Vagar. But, by the time the Dance of the Dragons takes place in 129 AC, Maelys had grown a bit slower and a bit lazy in her old age, but was still very fierce when roused. Rhaenys and Maelys would also go on to take part in the Battle of Rook's Rest, one of the bloodiest battles. One that is sure to be incredibly wild when we see it on House of the Dragon. Overall, Maelys was old, wise, cunning, and no stranger to battle herself. And the Red Queen and Rhaenys together were widely considered one of the most experienced duos of dragon and dragon rider to ever live. Up next, we have Sea Smoke. Sea Smoke was born in and around 101 AC and was the mount of Laenor Velaryon, and then later on was claimed by Adam of Hull. Sea Smoke was a silverish gray dragon and was said to be a young dragon at the start of the dance, but was still big enough for fighting size. After 101 AC, Laenor Velaryon had officially bonded with his dragon, and Sea Smoke was known to be the pride and passion of Laenor up until the time of Laenor's death in 120 AC. Sea Smoke then made his lair in the Dragon Mount on Dragonstone and remained there riderless for almost 10 years. When the Dance of the Dragons came around, the Blacks were looking for new dragon riders to go along with the many riderless dragons they had on Dragonstone. They offered lands, gold, and knighthoods to anyone who could claim any of the riderless dragons or wild dragons in the area. Most attempts ended up in death or worse, until 15-year-old Adam of Hull, who was rumored to be the bastard son of Lord Corlys Velaryon, managed to claim Sea Smoke for his own, after which Rhaenyra removed the bastard name and officially declared Adam of Hull Adam Velaryon, heir to Driftmark. Sea Smoke would go on to be involved in the fighting during the Dance of the Dragons, most notably during the Battle of Tumbleton. Up next we have Vermax. Vermax was born in 114 AC and was the mount of Jacaris Velaryon. Although his color is not described in the books, Vermax was said to be thriving and growing larger every year, but became very ill-tempered in the presence of snow, ice, and the cold. By the time of the Dance of the Dragons, Vermax was more than big enough to ride. Jacaris' mother Rhaenyra 
sent Jacaris to treat with many different houses to try and gain support for the Blacks against Aegon and the Greens. He first set out for the Vale of Arryn to treat with Lady Jane Arryn. Then he traveled to White Harbor to treat with Desmond Manderley. And finally, he went to Winterfell to meet with Cregan Stark. All three missions were widely successful as each house declared for Rhaenyra and the Blacks. Mushroom even claims that Vermax laid his very own clutch of eggs in the crypts of Winterfell, but this was never confirmed. Jakiris would go on to use Vermax in the Battle of the Gullet, but I won't go and spoil what exactly happens there as it is definitely going to happen on House of the Dragon and it is going to be a very big battle. Up next we have Arax. Arax was born in 115 AC and was the mount of Lucerius Velaryon. His color isn't described in the books, but art from the 2021 A Song of Ice and Fire calendar from Sam Hogg revealed him to be pearlescent white with golden eyes and a gold chest. His flames were also said to be yellow. Arax was big enough to ride during the time that the Dance of the Dragons started, but he was still growing and still very inexperienced. Rhaenyra sent Lucerys and Arax to Lord Baratheon at Storm's End, looking to gain his support against the Greens. Unfortunately for Luke and Arax, however, Aemon One-Eye had arrived at Storm's End before Luke and had already gained the support of House Baratheon. As Luke and Arax departed Storm's End, they were having trouble staying aloft during the harsh conditions, when suddenly, Aemon and Vagar appeared. Vagar was five times the size of Arax and a veteran of dozens of battles. The dragons met above Shipbreaker Bay, but unfortunately the fight did not last long, with Arax quickly succumbing to Vagar. Days later, it was said that the dragon's head and Lucerys' body washed up on shore. With his death, the War of Ravens came to an end, and the War of Fire and Blood officially began. Up next we have Taraxes. Taraxes was born in 117 AC and was the mount of Joffrey Velaryon, Rhaenyra's third son. Taraxes was slightly smaller than Vermax and Arax, but growing more and more every year. By the time the Dance of the Dragons came around, Taraxes was big enough to ride, but not big enough for combat quite yet. When Joffrey was a baby, an egg was placed in his cradle, as is custom for most Targaryen princelings, as to hopefully strengthen the bond between dragon and dragon rider. Joffrey pleaded with Rhaenyra to let him take part in the war, but Rhaenyra would forbid it at every turn. Joffrey was eventually sent to the Vale to be a ward of Lady Jane Arryn. Then, later on, Joffrey was summoned back to King's Landing and flew back to Rhaenyra on Taraxes, where he would make his lair on the Dragon Pit, until the riots broke out in the city and Taraxes was forced to defend himself killing so many humans that reportedly the entrance to his lair was completely blocked. Up next we have Dreamfire. Dreamfire was born in 32 AC at Dragonstone and was the mount of Reyna Targaryen and later claimed by Helena Targaryen. Dreamfire was a slender she-dragon. She was pale with blue silver markings and a silver crest. By 35 AC, Dreamfire was large enough for a 12-year-old Reyna Targaryen to mount. Dreamfire was first hatched during the reign of Aegon the Conqueror, and as a hatchling, she bonded with her future rider, Reyna. In 43 AC, Dreamfire had already produced two clutches of eggs, with a third clutch being laid years later in 49 AC. Then, in 54 AC, after the death of Reyna's daughter, Rainer went into self-imposed isolation at Harrenhal with Dreamfire until the time of her death in 73 AC. Years later, during the reign of King Viserys I, Dreamfire was later claimed by Helena Targaryen. But, after a tragic event known only as Blood and Cheese, Helena spent the rest of her days in isolation as well and in darkness, grieving over her loss and wasn't capable of even riding Dreamfire at that point who spent the rest of her days in the Dragon Pit. Up next we have Tessarion, the Blue Queen, one of my personal favorites. Tessarion was born in and around 120 AC and was the mount of Daeron Targaryen, aka Daeron the Daring, the third and youngest of the three sons Viserys Targaryen had with Alicent Hightower. 
Tessarion was a beautiful blue dragon with dark cobalt wings. Her claws, crest, and belly scales were bright copper. Her flames were even said to be a cobalt blue as well. In 129 AC, when the Dance of the Dragons begun, Tessarion was the youngest of all of the fighting dragons that belonged to the Greens, but was very nimble in the air. Prince Daron first bonded with Tessarion in 120 AC. It is unknown when Daron first rode Tessarion, but in 129 AC, he was already a dragon rider. Tessarion would go on to take part in the dance, seeing his first action during the Battle of the Honeywine. Tessarion would also become an invaluable part of the green scouting tactics, as Tessarion would often fly ahead above the main column to scout ahead. Rhaenyra loyalists would often flee at the sight of Tessarion, unwilling to face the dragon's flame. Daron the Daring and Tessarion would go on to fight in a few more key battles during the Dance of the Dragons, including the first and second Battles of Tumbleton. So rest assured, Daron and Tessarion will be involved in quite a few shocking moments during the war. Up next, we have Vermithor. Vermithor was born in 34 AC and was the mount of King Jaehaerys I Targaryen, and will also be one of the biggest dragons that we see during the dance. Vermithor's nickname was the Bronze Fury, having slick bronze skin and great tan wings. Only Balerion the Dread and Vagar were larger than Vermithor at the time. Then, at the start of the Dance of the Dragons, Vermithor was almost a hundred years old but was very accustomed to people at that time. Vermithor hatched from an egg that was placed in the cradle of Jaehaerys by his sister Reyna in 34 AC. Then, in 41 AC, Vermithor helped light the funeral pyre of Aenys I Targaryen. By 48 AC, Vermithor had accepted Jaehaerys as his rider, and the two of them flew to King's Landing to claim the throne after the death of Maegor the Cruel. The two would remain together until the time of Jaehaerys' death in 103 AC. Vermithor would then go on to be riderless for many years until the Dance of the Dragons came around, when the Blacks were looking for new dragon riders to claim the riderless dragons on Dragonstone. Many would-be dragon riders fell to Vermithor until a bastard by the name of Hugh Hammer successfully claimed the dragon for his own. The two would go on to take part in a few different battles during the Dance of the Dragons. Vermithor was the second largest dragon in the world at the time. Up next we have Moondancer. Moondancer was the mount of Bela Targaryen, daughter of Daemon Targaryen and Lena Velaryon. The exact date of Moondancer's birth is unknown, but in 129 AC, Moondancer was still a bit small to carry Bela. It wasn't until a year later that Bela was finally able to ride Moondancer for the first time, but she was still far too small for battle. Moondancer would remain on Dragonstone with Bela for most of the Dance of the Dragons. When Dragonstone eventually fell, however, Bela managed to reach Moondancer in the stables and mounted her, just as Aegon II flew Sunfire over Dragon Mount Smoking Peak, planning to make a triumphant landing in the courtyard. But just as that happened, Bela and Moondancer rose up to meet them in the sky and the two fiercely fought in the air until eventually Moondancer was blinded by a burst of flame shot from Sunfire. Even with no sight, Moondancer still managed to charge at Sunfire, as a dragon's first instinct is always going to be to attack. But eventually, Sunfire triumphed over Moondancer. The younger dragon was then devoured. Up next, we have Silverwing. Silverwing was born in 36 AC and was the mount of Queen Alysanne Targaryen, wife of Jaehaerys I, and was later claimed by Ulf the White during the Dance of the Dragons. Silverwing was described as her namesake, a silvery dragon that was very docile and extremely friendly towards humans. Silverwing hatched from an egg that had been placed in the cradle of Alysanne by her sister Reyna in 36 AC. Silverwing had accepted Alysanne as her rider by 48 AC. A year later, though, in 49 AC, Alysanne and Jaehaerys, along with their dragons, Silverwing and Vermithor, flew to Dragonstone to be married in secret. Dragonstone remained their refuge during the rest of the king's minority. In 58 AC, Queen Alysanne began a royal progress, flying to White Harbor, Winterfell, and the Wall. At Winterfell, however, Alaric Stark refused to let Silverwing within his walls. 
and even stranger still, when Alisane flew to the wall and attempted to fly north of the wall, the dragon veered off, refusing to follow her commands and fly north. Three different times Queen Alisane tried to take her dragon north of the wall, and three different times the dragon veered off, each time not responding to commands, which deeply bothered Alisane for years to come. Alisane flew Silverwing for the last time, however, in 93 AC, and later passed in 100 AC. After which, Silverwing flew back to Dragonstone, where she made her lair in one of the smoking vents on the Dragon Mount, where she remained until the Dance of the Dragons in 129 AC. Up next, we have the three wild dragons of Dragonstone, which Ryan Condal has confirmed will make an appearance on the show. Up first, we have Sheepstealer. Sheepstealer was born around 34 AC and was a wild male dragon living on Dragonstone during the time that the Dance of the Dragons took place. The small folk of Dragonstone named him Sheepstealer due to his affinity for mutton, and he would often hunt between the islands of Driftmark and Wentwater. Sheepstealer's color was described as mud brown, and while he wasn't particularly aggressive towards humans and less provoked, he could become ill-tempered at times. As his name suggests, he had a big taste for sheep, but never harmed any shepherds during his hunts. Sheepstealer's egg hatched during the reign of King Jaehaerys I, and he made his lair on the caverns of Dragonstone. Sheepstealer went unclaimed for most of his life, which only made him that much more resistant to humans with each passing year. Sheepstealer spent around seven decades living wild on Dragonstone, hunting sheep from pasture to pasture across Blackwater Bay. During an event that became known as the Sewing, many would-be dragon riders tried to claim Sheepstealer, to no avail, until a young girl named Nettle started leaving freshly killed sheep for him every morning, which eventually made the dragon grow more accustomed to her presence, and eventually Nettle managed to tame and mount the dragon for her own. Nettles and Sheepstealer would go on to join the Dance of the Dragons and fought in a few key battles and take part in a few key moments in the story, which I'm not going to spoil as they will probably be covered on House of the Dragon. Up next, we have Grey Ghost. Grey Ghost was born at Dragonstone, and while his exact age is unknown, he's believed to be a young dragon during the time of the dance. Given the name Grey Ghost by the small folk of Dragonstone, he had pale grey-white skin and was notably a shy dragon who avoided the works of men for years at a time. Grey Ghost preferred to feed on fish and could often be found flying over the narrow sea, snatching his prey from the waters. He made his lair on the eastern side of Dragonstone inside a smoking vent. Grey Ghost was never claimed by any rider during his lifetime, and during the Dance of the Dragons, Prince Jacaris Valarion was looking for new dragon riders to join the fight. They looked all over for Grey Ghost, but could never find him as the dragon was notoriously elusive. Then, in 130 AC, a ship saw Grey Ghost and another dragon fighting in the skies above Dragon Mount, where Grey Ghost was eventually slain in the struggle. Many believe Grey Ghost was killed by another wild dragon by the name of Cannibal, as Cannibal was often known to kill and eat younger dragons. But it turns out another dragon was responsible for the carnage, which will be revealed on the show as well, so I don't want to go into too many details about that, but rest assured, if we are getting Grey Ghost on the show, we'll be getting a pretty good dragon fight with it, I'm sure. Last, but certainly not least, we have the Cannibal. Cannibal was the third and largest of the wild dragons living on Dragonstone. Although his age is unknown, some believe that the cannibal lived on Dragonstone even before the Targaryens arrived, which would make him incredibly old, and it would make Cannibal the only dragon living in Westeros that doesn't hail from the Targaryen line. The small folk of Dragonstone named him Cannibal due to the fact that he would often kill and feast on younger dragons and dragon's eggs. The cannibal was black as coal with menacing green eyes, which is an awesome description, I must say. I'm really looking forward to seeing Cannibal in live action. It's probably going to look really, really cool. The cannibal was known to attack smaller dragons, and he made his lair on the eastern side of the Dragon Mount. Prior to the Dance of the Dragons, many would-be dragon riders would attempt to claim Cannibal for their own, only to end up decorating his lair with their bones. Cannibal had built up such a fierce reputation by the time the dance kicked off that when more dragon riders were needed, he was the one dragon that nobody risked disturbing. In 130 AC, when the carcass of Grey Ghost was discovered, many believed that it was Cannibal that did the deed, only to discover later that another dragon was responsible. 
Cannibal was one of only four dragons to survive past the Dance of the Dragons, but would later go on to vanish after the war. And there you have it, folks. The complete list of every fire-breathing beast that we will be seeing on the House of the Dragon TV series. And I cannot wait to see some more of these dragons in live action. Cannibal and Tessarion in particular, and all of the wild dragons for that matter. It would be really cool to see these dragons in their natural habitat. But let me know down in the comments section below which dragons are you looking forward to seeing most? Which dragon battles are you looking forward to seeing most? I would love to know. And as always, don't forget to slap a like on your way out. And I want to thank everybody out there for watching. And we will see you on the next one.